I really wanted to play for England for so long. And if you told you know, that boy in 15 years you'll be doing what you're doing now, then I, you know, I, would have, I would take that with both my hands and I would have grabbed about 20 other hands to try and take that as well. Whenever people talk about me now, they have to say England International, Mario Toje. And I want to have a long and sustained career for England. 50 caps means that it will be like a landmark in the wider journey and route that I want to take. My family uh, are Nigerians. Um, both my parents were born in Nigeria. Myself, my brother and my younger sister were born in, born in London and being Nigerian is a massive part of, of who we are. Like, even though we were in North London, like, when you stepped inside that house, it was, it was very Nigerian. Like, the house is full of food, and both my, well, my mum loves, loves cooking, I think she enjoys cooking, and my dad likes eating. <laughs> so, uh, my dad likes, to be fair, my dad likes cooking as well, but we, we, we leave it to the, to, to the professional. So, we've kind of been spoiled. And the way Nigerians operate is that they don't call you when they're coming, they just, they just turn up. You know, you, you open the door, you're like, oh, Auntie Bissy's at the door. Or you'd be like, oh, Uncle Balaji's at the door. <laughs> Um, the house was busy, the house was fun, it was, it was all, it always felt as if there was something going on. I had a good relationship with both my siblings. All in all, we were, you know, a good, good family unit. I think my um, personality on the field and off the field is very different. When I'm playing, I'm extremely confrontational. Um, I like maybe a little bit annoying people getting under their skin a little bit. Um, off the field, I'm very relaxed most of the time. I'm very chilled most of the time and relatively easygoing for the most part. I started playing rugby properly when I was 11. Um, I was at St George's for five years. And you know, at that time, I had just a significant athletic advantage over my peers. I was a lot taller, I was a lot stronger, and I was a lot quicker than, than most of them. So probably what lit the fire for me was that playing and being part of the team, being part of the A team, was like a bragging thing. Like, oh, I'm part of the A team, you're part of the B team, you're part of the C team. I didn't have any grand plans or grand visions per se. One of the things that seems a little bit ridiculous now, but at school, you're allowed to wear like representative honours ties. So you're allowed to wear like county rugby ties or an England tie if you play for England or South East England tie if you play for South East England. So I remember the day a whole new group of them went away. They played for county and they came back and all of them were wearing these, these Hertfordshire rugby ties. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. I want that tie. <laughs> I was like, I want that tie. So eventually the county trials came for, for myself. I was like, this is my opportunity to get that tie. And I thought that when I go back to school, wear this tie, I am going to be the guy. <laughs> Um, so a group of us went, when I came back with my tie, I was like, yep, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here with the tie. Um, which again was, was again, like, almost like a silly moment, but it was, it was a cool moment nonetheless. And during that process, that was when I got scouted for Saracens. At the end of the, the trial, this guy, came up to me, this like big guy came up to me. He was like, uh, Mara, um, I would like you to come to the Saracens Academy training, EPTG training on Tuesday and Thursday nights. Would you be okay with that? Then I was like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. So I was super, super pumped, super excited. I remember going to the first Saracens Academy training 
and I was like nervous, really nervous. And there it was like an all star team of all the best players that I've played against in the like the local area. Um, even at that early age, I was training at Saracens, but I wasn't really too sure whether or not, you know, that would be a career for me. My house master, or the rugby master, um, called my dad and was like, "Oh, Mr. Toje, you know your son is your son is quite good at rugby. He's um, he might have a future there." Then my dad started to get worried. Um, he said, "Oh, I hope this rugby is not like distracting him from his academics." Um, so he called me one day and was like, oh, "Mara, I heard you're playing rugby now." So I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm really enjoying it. It's going well." It was like, I'm okay with you playing rugby, but if your grades drop, the rugby stops. <laughs> um, I was like, don't worry, I'll make sure my grades, my grades are always, always good. Rugby isn't really a thing in Nigeria. For them, it was always a hobby. There was one April Fool's Day, uh, I was in school, and I sent my dad an email, I was like, Dad, look, I want to be a rugby player. I don't want you to pressure me to go to uni like this is my decision I hope you respect it my dad didn't talk to me for three days <laughs> and I told my mum so my dad called my mum have you, have, you, have you seen what your son is doing he's your son now have you seen what your son is doing uh, he said he doesn't want to go to school and my mum was like oh, what can we do he doesn't want to go to school what, can we force him what can we do so you're supporting this behavior. <laughs> Says you're supporting this behavior. Like, what can we do? Can we force him? Can we physically push him to go to school? What can we do? So my dad was like, he said he couldn't sleep. <laughs> he said he couldn't sleep. Um, then I eventually told him that, um, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to April Fool's. Um, he was like, what was I going to tell my friends? <laughs> he, he would have been embarrassed. So that was my parents at the early stages of, of my career. Now, my parents, my dad watches more rugby than me. My dad is a huge rugby fan. My parents have traveled around the world watching me play. They've come to Tokyo, they've come to uh, New Zealand, they've come to South Africa. My parents, they love rugby so much that they come and watch second team games at Saracens. Their social calendar is almost built in and around um, rugby. So even the start of the season, I'm not going to play too many games due to finishing the season late. My dad was like, oh, make sure you get us tickets. They, um, they need to know that we're there to support <laughs> through, through thick and thin. <laughs> <laughs> I was about 16 or so, I got a call from my academy manager saying that I would like you to train with the first team tomorrow. And I was, you know, I was pumped. I was like, oh my goodness. I got, I got off the phone, I ran upstairs. My mum was on the phone to talk to one of her friends. I was like, mum, 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 I'm, uh, I'm going to train with the first team tomorrow. And then she was like, oh, is that meant to be a good thing? <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, and in a way, um, from, I actually think, in reflection, I think that was really good because rugby was never really part of the vision. So they never put any pressure on me. They were never like, oh, make sure you go to training, make sure you do this, make sure you eat that. All of that was all self self-driven. When I first started playing for Saracens, I wasn't good enough to be in the first team and I wasn't good enough to be in the second team. So unless you just want to keep trying to prove yourself in training, you kind of need to be in a situation where you're playing because playing is the best, best way you can you know, showcase talents and improve. I didn't play a ridiculous amount of games for old Albanians, but it supplemented the games that you know I was missing or the games that I wasn't playing for Saracens. I felt as if going to uni like actually made me a better rugby player because Saracens were incredibly supportive of myself going to uni. 
and they did everything they could to facilitate me going. I didn't want anyone to say my schoolwork was taken away from my rugby. I didn't want anyone to say that my rugby was having a negative effect on my academics, so I just found a way to balance it. I would really struggle to do that now. But at the time, in order to get this degree, in order to be a successful rugby player, it just felt this is what this is just what I have to do. So I used to wake up uh, probably sometime around 5.50, 6 o'clock. I couldn't catch a lift with anyone, so I had to cycle. Put my back back on. <laughs> cycle my way to training. So it used to take me about 40 minutes to get to all other areas. Get there for 6.50 weigh-in, 7 o'clock in the gym, around about 8.30, 8.45, go get some breakfast, and go back over around 9.45, 10 for minutes, scrums, moves, then the squad meeting was at 1 o'clock. Back on my bike, cycle into the station, train into London, lecture, 3 to 5. I'll get the train back into St. Albans then get ready for loan club training. Share a list with some of my housemates at the time, 79, then back home. And by that time, sleep. It was a bit bad, <laughs> it was a bit bad. But what, what, what I'm trying to say is, at the time, I looked at it as, this is what I have to do in order to get where I want to get. In life, I think you make time for things that you think are important. If you truly believe that it's important, no matter how busy your schedule is, you'll find the time to do it. So my goal was to play for the first team and be a regular and a, and a starter in the first team. Once that was achieved, the whole change was to you know, cement my position within this team, but then go look for international honours. Eddie called me and I was upstairs in my room, got the call, uh, Mara, um, I'm going to pick you for this, for the squad, this, this Six Nations, get, get ready to work. Um, and that was it, so I got in, I went downstairs, told, told my family, my, my phone went, went a little bit crazy, um, we, were, we were here. I really wanted to play for England for so long. I really wanted to be an England player. And finally reaching and making my debut was like a war move. I, was like, I remember running onto the pitch, I came off the bench. Maro Atoje, who we're told, who we think will have a big international future, is about to take his first international steps, preparing to come on. The young Saracen. 21-year-old Maro Otoji on for his England debut. And I was like, I've actually played for England now. I was almost a sense of relief, but I was like, I'm actually an England player now. I've got my cap number. No one can take that away from me. I've played for England. Whenever people talk about me now, they have to say England international, Maro Otoji. The way I think about that experience was just thinking about you know, everything that it kind of took to, to get there. To be honest, I don't know what's worse, having one cap or having no caps. Uh, I don't know what's worse. So at the time, it was like, okay, yeah, I'm here, but I need to get a few more caps for me to be even at least semi comfortable. Um, then I realized that comfortable kind of state of mind that you're looking for never really comes um, because there's always more that you want to do. So at the time, um, I just wanted to get as, as, as many as possible. I feel as if at that level there's a few non-negotiables that you, you know, it sounds a bit cliche and it's probably not going to surprise people, but 
you have to be able to like work hard and there's different levels of working hard all rugby players work hard to an extent but I think there's levels of of hard work that you need to be able to push yourself to go to go to and you need to be able to deliver for your team because often rugby is such a tough sport if you're the one who's not working quite as hard as as the others you're probably going to be vulnerable and you're probably going to open up some holes for your for for the, for the other team to exploit you have to be honest with yourself with your performance with how you're going about your business and probably first and foremost you have to be committed you have to be committed to the cause you have to be committed to the team um committed to the team's success obviously that you you have to switch off you have to like get your mental rest where where you needed but it's it's you can't train like Tarzan and then live the rest of your life like Mick Jagger. It does it does it doesn't it doesn't make sense. You have to be committed to the success of of the teams that you play for, and that is exhibited through you know your personal behavior, your life choices, your lifestyle. Unfortunately, I've like kind of ticked off the individual, a lot of the individual accolades. So now it's, you know, you know I want to win for England, win Six Nations, win Test matches, win World Cups. They've got four minutes in which to do it. There goes a Toji, and he's in. And what I find with sport is that things move very quickly. So now all roads are leading to France in 2023, Paris 23. So you know, the, the focus quickly changes. You know, I want to have a long and sustained career for England. Um, and you know, 50 caps means that you've been playing for England for a decent amount of time now. You know, it will be like a landmark in the wider journey that you know and, and route that I want to take. So uh, of course, you know, not many people get to 50. So as long as I put my best foot forward, I think I will. I'll sleep easy at night.